This is the National Endowment for the Humanities Annual Lecture from St. John's College. Ulysses, Does Your Life Matter? The Conspiracy Against Knowing Who You Are and How to Fight This Conspiracy with Amor Matris. This talk is dedicated to my precious daughter Maeve and eldest grandchild Gideon, who drowned together a year ago on April 2nd. You are in my heart. Come wake me one morning. Surprise me as you used to do. I dedicate this also to my students and colleagues who have read Ulysses with me. I'm grateful for our joyous shared immersion and I can hardly distinguish my thoughts from yours. Ulysses was banned in America when a judge ruled, quote, the part where the man comes off in his pants is obscene in intent, unquote. I don't think Ulysses is a dirty book, but it is fearless. It dares to depict private thoughts and bodily functions shamelessly and challenges us to distinguish amor matris, nurturing love, from narcissism and self-abuse in all of its guises. So as Tina Turner might say to the American judge, what's masturbation got to do with it? And this we will be exploring. Do you care that there are sanctimonious censors who would prevent you from reading Ulysses? Joyce battled religious, political, and economic tyranny all his life. Customs agents of the American government and all English-speaking governments burned many copies of Ulysses. Such actors no doubt believe that they burn books for your own good. They think you are incapable of freely choosing what to read, say, think, and do. Tyrants punish you for reading what you will and for loving as you will. Why do people do this to one another? Because those who love and do what they will are dangerous and fierce, just as is a mother who freely loves her child. Mothers are certain that their children deserve love and freedom. People infused with amor matris, mother love, who love with a deep love in their hearts, will never surrender love and freedom to tyranny. And this is why tyrants do not care if we hate them so long as we do not love one another. And this is why those with a passion to dominate fear most the intense ferocity of the love of the mother, amor matris. Tonight I would like to propose that this book about a man wandering around Dublin is a call for mother love as an answer to individual and social tyranny. I will set forth a key theme in Joyce's masterpiece that to combat tyranny, human beings must take up two challenges. We must know ourselves and we must bravely combat a conspiracy that would prevent us from knowing who we are. Three of the four great tyrants who would terrify us into submission are the religious, the political, and the economic. All rely on a fourth fundamental tyranny our inner tyranny of fear of death. Ireland's history is a nightmare of death. Millions starved in the Great Famine of 1846. Millions more fled or were transported across the Atlantic in coffin ships. Ireland's population fell from 8 million to 4 million by June 16, 1904, the Bloomsday of Ulysses. That's comparable to losing 200 million Americans. Grandparents of the characters in Ulysses died in the famine. Their survivors are desperate to live. But death haunts the Irish. Remorse hobbles our three protagonists like the tap, tap, tap of rats hastily gnawing corpses in Dublin cemetery before flesh becomes gas. Peasants outside, green starving faces eating dock leaves. Here's a common Dublin greeting. How are things going? Just keep it alive. It may seem obvious to say that the enabling passion for overcoming fear and death is love. The Hebraic and Hellenic traditions in which we immerse ourselves at St. John's 
both assert this. Love already is the word known to all men. But Ulysses argues that these traditions haven't worked for the third world Irish. A new synthesis arises, a way of achieving self-knowledge and freedom from this conspiracy of fear, a transformation of the Hebraic and Hellenic arising as amor matris, two Latin words which name, uh, which defeat tyranny and fear. These two Latin words are subjective and objective genit genitive, the only true thing in life. The words depict the reciprocal love of a mother for a child and the love of anyone for the mother, objective and subjective. The enabling love of amor matris is the theme of Joyce's masterpiece and it's the way to overcome fear smash the chains of tyranny, and throw off the conspiracy against knowing who you are. What is truly remarkable in Joyce's story is that it is a man rather than a woman who is the embodiment of this virtue and shows us how to live by it. In Ulysses, mothering is not gender specific. Both men and women are capable of mothering love by incarnating reason in heart and action. Also remarkable is that the embodiment of Amor Matris is Leopold Bloom, an ordinary, troubled, common man. Amor Matris is not an extraordinary virtue of singular heroes, but a common virtue akin to Confucius' central principle, reciprocity. It harmonizes, connects, and tethers the rational to the empathic. The intellect of those who mother is relational, not hierarchical, not hermetic. Bloom is the new womanly man, the new Irishman, the one to lead us out of the desert of inner and outer tyranny to the new Ireland, the new Jerusalem, the new Blue Muslim. Via the stories of the three main characters, Ulysses gives you a purpose-driven way to free yourself, your native land, your dearest associations, your working life, your family and friends, and your soul from tyranny and death. Like its ancestors, the Bible, Dante's Divine Comedy, Shakespeare's plays, and the oral and epic traditions of Ireland, Ulysses glows with music, image, and vision, spinning on one central question, what is the word known to all men? For Joyce, this word is love expressed as reciprocity. Ulysses reveals how we can break in twain the galling chains and free our native land and ourselves in just one day, June 16th, 1904, or today. Break the chains, rise up in the light of freedom, climb Mount Pisgah, and see the promised land. Why should a contemporary American care about a book written a century ago about an ordinary day lived by common people in Dublin, a poor, tyrannized, third world colony in the backwater of the empire. Because we may be as asleep as Dubliners in Ulysses. We too may suffer a general paralysis, deranging our sense of reality and our moral agency to love. Ulysses is a great book and great books are interesting because they are about you. Otherwise, old books are mere antiquarian artifacts. To see that Ulysses is about you, you have to know who you are. Near the end of the book, Bloom stands up to and outwits two armed soldiers who have knocked a young student, Stephen Dedalus, flat and may kill him in the street. Akin to midwife Socrates, Bloom births Stephen into a world in which his life matters. Practicing Amor Matris, Bloom now knows who he is. His mothering enables him to face death to save Stephen. He brings him home and nurses him back to health. Dubliners in Ulysses submit unawares to tyranny, with few notable exceptions. The people Bloom meets are bitter, resentful, angry, wrathful, proud, envious, numb, or self-destructive. But the spirit of Tir Nanog the ancient promised land of Irish legend persists deep within, as does the longing for freedom of the 1798 rebellion. One day, love, light, 
and life may awaken in you, and the dead may awaken in you. All three of Joyce's principal characters are struggling against tyranny, and each is waging his or her own unique and particular battle to achieve self-knowledge, a sense of connection, and reciprocal, deep, fulfilling love that will set them free. Simultaneously, all are trapped within the political, religious, and economic tyrannies particular to their time and place. I will not discuss these three tyrannies extensively tonight, but will spotlight just the influence of a fourth prevalent tyranny, the fear of death. All three of our characters, the 38-year-old man, the buxom 33-year-old professional woman, and the searching young student, are manacled by grief and its associated fear of death. Only if they can find a way to manage these will they be able to find their way to self-knowledge, reciprocal love, love, and liber liberation. First, I will turn to fear of death that tyrannizes our three, and then secondly, I will elaborate on our characters' struggles with respect to love. Death dominates, preoccupies, and determines the relationships of our protagonists. Each is prevented from living a full life due to grief. Our Telemachus, the young student Stephen Dedalus, has lost his mother. Our Odysseus, Leopold Bloom, is haunted by the death of his only son, Rudy, and by the suicide of his father. Our Penelope, Molly, like Leopold, grieves the loss of their boy. Each of these three principles is haunted and hobbled by those they have lost, and each must find a way through the grief to amor matris and freedom. How can amor matris overcome the domineering fear of death that tyranny relies upon? We will see as we follow the courses of Molly, Bloom, and Stephen. So I'll now consider the quests of our three characters. First, I will, in a general way, outline each character's challenge, and then further along, I'll go into detail as to the particular tangles faced by each. Each of Joyce's characters is beset with a particular quandary when it comes to the quest for love. None can fully embody amor matris. None has mastered both expression and receipt of the mother love that will enable them to experience true, fulfilling love. Each is stuck in their own way, and each must find his or her portal to the prerequisite awakening. Each character has a need for self-clarity and possesses a burning desire for love, for true connection, but each has a problem achieving fulfillment. Leopold Bloom's desire is for the fully expressed, reciprocal, conjugal love now missing with his wife. Though he mothers his wife better than any other man and possesses the capacity for amor matris needed to overcome tyranny, he is caught in a struggle both to metabolize his grief and to know how best to express himself as a man. He must somehow reach Molly. Molly desires deep love. Her problem is she doesn't yet know that Leopold can deliver the goods. Perhaps because he doesn't fit the Dublin stereotype, Molly doesn't know that Leopold is her man. She does what she can to embrace life in her own way, but she is unable to make the desert bloom in the bed in which Rudy was conceived, born, lived 11 days, and died 11 years ago. Since Rudy's death, Molly and Leopold have not had vaginal sex. She too needs to reorient her grief and her amor matris to embrace and nurture Leopold and their daughter, Millie. Our third character, Stephen Dedalus, the young student, is engaged in a young man's struggle for identity. Hampered like the others by his grieving, he too needs to absorb amor matris into his definition of what it is to be a man, to know, and be free. Young Stephen needs to learn this from Leopold Bloom. Each character is loving in his or her own way, and it is a good way, but it is partial and does not permit full flowering of amor matris, strengthened by desire. They suffer, feel the pain of fear and death, but haven't nurtured suffering 
in a way that liberates them to love. Now for the specifics of Molly's story. She, the woman, is a voluptuous, talented woman at that, might seem to our stereotyping minds like the logical embodiment of Amor Matris, but in fact, she is not. While Molly is every man's ideal erotic object, she does not express caring maternal love. In Ulysses, Leopold is the homemaker and daughter Millie's primary caregiver, not Molly. Poldy is the one who nurtures and mothers. If we look to compare Joyce's women to those of Homer, Penelope stay at home, raises her son Telemachus as a solo parent, while Joyce's more contemporary wife, Molly, does not do the caretaking of surviving daughter Millie. In the Odyssey, Penelope suffers a sexual famine twice as long as that of Molly, while Odysseus lustily wanders the Mediterranean for the length of a generation. Molly, by contrast, herself travels Ireland, singing for and seducing the public while the couple is in sexual famine. In the Joycean tale, the wife is the wanderer. Inattentive mother Molly fills halls and churches with her arresting soprano, reminiscent of the sirens, and transfixes audiences with her alluring, voluptuous body, reminiscent of Circe and Calypso. Her coloratura soprano, lips, eyes, lungs, womb, ample breast, and buttocks are portals of discovery for others. A great artist, Molly marshals every aspect of her 160 pound body that Joyce describes as an armful. Ah, to be near her ample bed warm flesh. Yes. She really is one of the best sopranos in Ireland. On a particular night, burned into admirer Lenahan's memory, Molly mothers the male passengers in a carriage, leading them all in song. Lenahan recalls a decade later how Molly's unintentional rubbing against him as she sings during the ride transports him up into the Milky Way. The lad stood at attention. Molly has rocketed many to new heights and similar visions. She is word and music made flesh. Molly singing Mercadante's Seven Last Words of Christ, or Rossini's Stabat Mater, which depicts Mary, the sorrowful mother, standing and suffering at her son's crucifixion, transfixes the entire Dublin congregation in an ecstasy of meditation and prayer. As she pitches her voice to the far corner, as Leopold has directed her to do, you could hear a pin drop. Whether singing religious operatic or popular music, Molly holds audiences with her stage presence, her breasts, lips, and eyes. The sight and sound of her makes her audience feel cradled and suckled. Molly is dialectic incarnation of Eros and Thanatos, of Amor Matris, and of Mother Ireland. She is Marion by name, that is Mary own, in Greek, the being of Mary. Amor Matris in song. Through her art, her endless song, which channels Mary's grief for her lost son, Molly serves as conduit for the universal human experience of loss and connects parent to child. In the kind of mother's lullaby she emits, past becomes present in a mass or a concert. Music has the power to reenact the past in retrospective arrangement, connecting ancestors and recently lost children and loved ones with those who live. As we sing together, we learn that the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. Music is Molly's valiant effort to overcome death, her answer to the loss of her son. But for her personally, it is not adequate. As Molly sings, she is a kind of angel, a great sweet mother for others, a seeming embodiment of maternal love, and a cathartic expression of beautiful, relieving grief for the many in the audience. Though this fails to translate into amor matris for her devoted husband. Music does provide the Irish and Molly a partial outlet for grief, 
By witnessing how she moves her audience, Molly can vicariously, but not fully, weep. Two, it permits her to appear to offer love to others and to receive lusty admiration from men. Both, however, are one way and incomplete, and ultimately not the real thing. Her music is a desire rightly directed to overcome death, but the reciprocity of any love that flows from it is constrained. She is eliciter and recipient of erotic love rather than its giver, and Amor Matris is not combined with Eros for Leopold. True intimacy is missing from the compromise she has made in order to contain her mourning. This thus is Molly's challenge, how to let herself directly grieve, face her fear of death, and give up the flattering but superficial unsatisfactory lust of her male audience members and embrace the wholehearted love offered by her patient, long-suffering husband. She can make others love her, but can neither love them back nor accept the true love available to her. Reciprocity is necessary for love that quenches and fulfills desire. Some are gifted at being great mothers in the public realm, but not in the personal. Though she cannot yet express nurturing mothering love to her own family and is unfinished as well as we all are in our ability to love fully, Molly's music provides a great service of amor matris to those who hear her sing and points to mothering love's sturdy importance and power. The endless eternal song of amor matris, such as that to which Molly gives voice, enables the dead to awaken and broken souls, families, and cities like Dublin to swell like a gravid womb. Song flows from Molly's smiling mouth as sensual and as enchanting as Dante's Beatrice. Irish orators like Emmett, O'Connell, and Parnell deliver Amor Matris in their own voices. We Americans hear this same powerful poetry in the words of American orators, like Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King. In his first inaugural, Lincoln echoed Daniel O'Connell's speeches at Tara to one million Irishmen summoning a nation torn by discord and violence to union and love. Here's Lincoln. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. In this speech, Lincoln's Amor Matris fills us with mystic chords and depicts the mystic naval chord connecting ourselves to our ancestors and our posterity. A century after Lincoln delivered this inaugural from the Capitol steps, Martin Luther King delivered a speech from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial singing again the chords of ancient, endless amor matris, culminating in this stump winder. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And after chanting the refrain, let freedom ring nine times, King ends with, let freedom ring, and when this happens, all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Now let's turn from Molly to Leopold, our man gifted in Amor Matris, but still baffled as to how to obtain full marital love. Come in now to this bedroom in Dublin and slip between the sheets of Eros and Thanatos of birth, copulation, starvation, and death. We join the Blooms, our Odysseus and his Penelope, as Leopold brings Molly her breakfast in bed, a bed that holds all of Molly's history, the bed where Rudy died, 11 days old. It is also Molly's father's bed, made in Gibraltar at the portal of Europe and Africa, the portal 
Ulysses sailed beyond to his death, Dante describes. As Leopold serves her tea and toast, prepared just the way she likes it, he gazes longingly but calmly down her bulk and between her large soft bubs, sloping between her night breasts like a shago's udder. Her full lips smiled, her twisted gray garter looped round a stocking. Denied amatory access to her body, but with attentive care, Leopold dutifully and longingly mothers Molly as his wife and mother of Millie and Rudy. He provides her amor matris in all of its aspects. Mothers to the masses themselves need mothering, and Leopold provides this. To do so, he addresses his wife's whims, bringing her meals, serving as primary caregiver for their child, and keeping up with rituals, birthdays, and anniversaries. All this he does while heaving his own ballast of grief. Bloom's father, Rudolph, killed himself 12 years ago. Bloom lives between a dead father and a dead son. Leopold, as a mothering man, is a puzzle to his fellow Dubliners. Lenahan and Callahan, two of Molly's admirers, share the common Dublin sense of being gobsmacked as to how this half-and-half, half unprepossessing greaser, Leopold, managed to marry gorgeous Molly. All of the Achaeans and Homer wonder similarly, how did Menelaus get Helen for a wife? Considering this perplexing state of affairs, let's look again at Lenahan's fixation on the tantalizing long-ago carriage ride with a singing Molly. Every jolt of the bloody car, I had her bumping up against me. Hell's delights. As Molly sang that day, Lenahan imagined that she'd set in motion and handed him a universe. But in the end, Lenahan's hands grasp only dead air while Bloom holds Molly. Lenahan has to admit in wonder that Bloom is extraordinary. He knows all the stars and the comets in the heavens, knows them all. And what star's that, Poldy, she says. But wonder and love unsettle Lenahan. A typical Dublin male, he turns away from the music of Amor Matris with crude phallic jokes, the age-old male solution of competitive frustration and resentment, making dismissive remarks, such as this one by Callahan, regarding the stars. Sure, that's only what you might call a pinprick. Every male in Dublin seems to resent that, as James Henry Menton calls him, this, quote, coon bloom, and not he has Molly. Men in Ulysses, fearful of the care and tenderness of mothering that Leopold freely expresses, distract themselves with violence and erotic banner. The interactions between men in which Bloom participates are often sexual. But let's be clear that Leopold Bloom is one of the few Dubliners who behaves like an adult. He never engages in the phallic banter of ch childish locker room rituals. Leopold's mind and heart are filled with warm affection for Molly's ample bedwarm flesh. Leopold doesn't mock women and he doesn't mock love, but tries to speak a language of caring. Bloom is a deep feeling person, not cynical, not nihilistic, not cruel, not reeking with envy, pride, wrath, or resentment like most of Dublin. Why not? I don't know for sure. But I think it's because Leopold truly loves Molly, body and soul. And this true amor matris distinguishes him. Bloom is a new man of hope in the midst of separation, starvation, nihilism and death. While Leopold possesses the great virtue of Amor Matris that if blended with Eros provides true fulfillment and is Joyce's image of the man who can lead us out of tyranny, he like his wife is not fulfilled in the arena of love. What will make his mate turn to him? Now for the infamous scene in episode 13 that so upset the authorities. My admiration for this scene may seem to fly in the face of the condemnation with which it was met on publication, but you will judge for yourselves. This Nausicaa episode, in this episode, Bloom 
whose libido needs an outlet has a spontaneous erotic encounter with a young woman named Gertie on the beach. The interaction echoes Odysseus's conversation with Nausicaa on the beach of Scaria. In Homer's scene, the man and the woman, both strangers and nude, speak but do not touch. Sex, if any, occurs in the mind, and the mind is exactly where the censors of America and the celibate Irish clergy want their enforcers patrolling. It's more efficient for tyrants to station their police in your mind than to maintain an external force. Your mind now does the tyrant's work for him at minimal cost as you recruit your own internal conspiracy against knowing who you are. From a distance, Blue meditates on Gertie swinging her leg like a thurible filling a church with incense. As she gyrates her leg, Thomas Aquinas' hymn, Tantum Ergo, wafts a synesthesia of sound, scent, and vibration from the Church of Mary, Star of the Sea. The priest displays the communion host in its monstrance as the congregation ejaculates its litany to Mary. As Bloom watches Gertie swung her leg more in and out of time, showing him her virgin portal, veiled in Mary's sky blue, Bloom is literally worshiping at her shrine. Gertie's rhythm arouses Bloom, and she felt a kind of sensation rushing all over her as Bloom ejaculates like a rocket and a Roman candle bursts in the sky. So do you begin to see now what masturbation has to do with it? Lord, I am wet, Bloom presently notes to himself. Is this Bloom's prayer of union and fertility? The large question is, can Bloom convert his onanism into procreative sex? Can he and Molly renew reciprocal amor matris that Poldy has kept alive and have another child? She benefits from his mothering love all the time, but can she find her own, united with Eros, and take him in her arms? Let us now turn to our third character, the young Stephen Dedalus. What is he up against? How will he come to know himself, access amor matris, fulfilling love and connection, and thus free himself from tyranny? There's a lot going on within Stephen, and as noted earlier, Stephen is dogged by grief, and a main challenge for him is to metabolize this in order to bloom and answer the call of his martyr and artist namesake, Stephen and Daedalus. Also hampering him is that he, along with Bloom, has spent a lot of time with Mulligan, a sarcastic, tyrannical sort of man, the opposite to Bloom. Mulligan relentlessly belittles Stephen's fledgling ideas. Intimidated by Mulligan's satanic abuse, Stephen has given up doing anything because the older man's denigration has kept him from knowing who he is. He doesn't dare let out what's going on inside him, so he cannot know himself or break himself free. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart, but desire is also urgent in Stephen. No, mother, let me live. How to unchain his spirit from abuse. How to walk away from the locked Martello Tower and turn the seminar in which he participates at the National Library into action. The key is in the lock, Stephen said. Turn it. In the library seminar on Shakespeare, a young man tries to think seriously about amor matris in the midst of a sterile, onanistic conversation dominated by older men. He, like Leopold, confronts prevailing notions of what it is to be a proper Dublin man. In particular, he must contend with the self-centered intellectual narcissism so many Dublin men practice. So here we are with older men in the library. In this scene, Joyce depicts an opposition between creative mothering love and inverted phallic sterility and presents amor matris as the way out of self-obsessed tyranny. Leopold's beachside autoeroticism seems born of a yearning for reciprocity. The men in the library, in contrast to Leopold, routinely practice mental masturbation. Fearing amor matris, phobic of suffering from love, 
They spill out their life force like Onan to avoid intimacy, nurturing, mothering, and birth. The contrary of Amor Matris is stir sterile rubbing of body, mind, or spirit that forsakes mothering love, caring, and nurturing for the rubbing of Molly that Lenihan recalls in the carriage. Are the members of the Shakespeare seminar in the library rubbing against Amor Matris, or are they lovingly engaged? If you find yourself in a seminar, you may want to recognize the difference. In Joyce's seminar, the jejune but alert Stephen gamely joins in the men's discussion of Shakespeare, Hamlet, and the true love of fathers, mothers, spouses, and children, while the other male interlocutors turn to verbal repartee with no apparent purpose. He, Stephen, participates in the conversation with jovial, jovial but serious philosophical purpose, arguing and bantering in favor of tender and creative mother love. The other men, while appearing to talk of platonic forms, do so with such untethered distraction that you might call them sophists. The worst is Mulligan, whose cruel, cynical wit belittles Stephen and puts others into tribes so that he can mock and abuse them. Mulligan is a narrow fellow, arrogant, cruel, and disgusting. He tempts Stephen to crawl on his level with abhorrent racism and sexism, ridiculing women, referring to Bloom as the Sheeny. What's his name, Ike Moses? From the outset, suspense hangs on Mulligan introducing Stephen with this cruel remark. Ah, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. In the library, Mulligan descends further to feign a moment of birth. He grasps his head to parturiate and writes down a play on male masturbation entitled, Every Man His Own Wife or a honeymoon in the hand. Manipulating language to no purpose but cruel glee, Mulligan is like a late night television and social media run amok. All his tweets are more like farts and remind Stephen of Dante's devil in Inferno, et egli avea del cul fato trombetta, which is to say the devils blasting trumpets out of their asses, uh, which is Inferno 21, uh, Inferno 9 if you want to look up. It is Stephen rather than Mulligan who in the library undergoes the moment of birth. He recognizes the man's intelligence, but newly sees that this cruel untethered wit is sterile and abusive. Mulligan lacks the amor matris that both Hamlet and Stephen seek as a mooring. Amor matris makes free thinking writers dangerous to domineering tyrants and their cynical brood of vipers and sycophants. To know who he is and obtain the love he craves, Stephen must dare heresy, like his namesake, the first Christian martyr. He suddenly realizes he must put it all on the line and leave Mulligan in order to love and create, even if it means he will be stoned to death. He mulls, part, the moment is now. If Socrates leave his house today, I in time must come ineluctably, my will, his will that confronts me, seas between. In the open sea at the end of this episode 9, Bloom passes between Stephen and Mulligan. A reversal occurs as Bloom enters Stephen's space now for the first time, midway through Ulysses. Stephen now departs Priapic Mulligan to seek a true father in mothering Bloom. Becoming closer now in heart, both mothering father and mother-loving child steer for the amor matris in each other. Stephen needs the experience of Bloom's mothering care to overthrow Mulligan's relentless cruel abuse of language, faith, hope, and love. The culmination of Bloom's amor matris, I so want to be a mother, occurs in the aforementioned episode 15 when Leopold saves Stephen from a vicious, possibly deadly beating by two British privates. One strikes him in the face. Stephen totters, collapses, falls, stunned. He lies prone. Bloom stands up to the drunken redcoats and the colonial police. He keeps them from beating Stephen further or fatally. He then tends him like a midwife or mother, saving his life and getting him to breathe. Bloom, the new womanly man, risks his life to save his young friend. 
Stephen often reads Thomas Aquinas in Latin. True love, says St. Thomas, requires one to will another's good. This is the mother's skill. This Stephen senses Mulligan cannot do. Blazes Boylan can't do it. King Edward can't do it. Lord Dudley, Vice Regent of Ireland, can't do it. And the mansplaining characters in Mulligan's play, A Honeymoon in the Hand, A National Immorality in Three Orgasms, can't do it. These men serve only themselves, as tyrants always do. True love requires them to will another's good, but they can't extend a hand outward. St. Thomas construes masturbation as a form of the deadly sin of avarice. A person ruled by avarice rejects the possibility of offering love's tender affection to a stranger who may desperately need it, and instead greedily turns love inward to benefit only himself. By extension, Joyce implies avarice is the root of the political, religious, and economic tyranny Dublin suffers. Masturbation may not be evil in itself, but prioritizing pleasing oneself alone over true amatory connection is the very opposite of amor matris. Now let's go back to bed with Molly to examine if and how the couple might resolve their love problems. The book she is reading while tucked between the blankets is entitled Ruby by a Frenchman named Paul de Kock. Molly points out to her husband an illustration of the novel's female protagonist showing her naked sprawled on the floor. Facing the illustration of the naked Ruby sits a word made flesh in print that Molly cannot understand. She touches this word with her hairpin as if holding a yod to the Torah and asks her husband rabbi to interpret. Metempsychosis, says Bloom. It's from the Greek. That means the transmigration of souls. Ah, oh, rocks, tell us in plain words, Molly retorts. Bloom smiles at her mocking eyes, the same young eyes that enchant her audiences from the stage. All admire her art, but Bloom loves her intimately, understands her, supports her career, knows her longings, and her hunger to learn. He mothers her soul. The scene that unfolds from here is a portal of discovery for Molly and reveals to us why she is drawn to and chooses Leopold over other men. Bloom searches for an example to teach his mate the definition of reincarnation. He settles, settles upon naked nymphs, Greece, for instance, all the people that lived then. And with this in mind, he motions to the painting Bath of the Nymphs from Titbits, a mildly erotic Easter periodical. Bloom explains, metempsychosis is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance, what they call nymphs, for example. Molly's laughing eyes shine at the thought. For Bloom, metempsychosis overcomes death, and via his explanation, he offers Molly a mirror, a sense that she is like other women and in the company of pilgrim souls through the ages. Her loss of their son is not just her own, but something experienced by many naked women since ancient times. Through metempsychosis, he implies, our ancestors, our lost children live on, and we will live on beyond deaths. And in this way, via a nurturing moment of amor matris, Leopold hands his wife a reply to death. Ancestors may live within you. Neither you, your language, nor the conversation going on in your intellect, should you pay attention is solitary nor devoid of friends, family, and those you love, both alive and dead. You are not alone. This chorus swells from every grave, from Rudy's in Dublin, to those starved in the famine, to the patriot graves of Irish at home or abroad in America. We are all connected by mystic cords 
listen. Almost magically, but actually through Leopold's attentive, tender teaching, Molly is offered a gift. Might she awaken herself, come upon a way to hold her grief, and loosen the grip of the fear of death that has stopped her from embracing her husband? Suddenly, Molly's nostrils arch like a priestess divining a burnt offering. She smells kidney burning on the stove. As alert as Bloom is sensually, Molly's senses are even better. He rushes down the stairs to save his toothsome organ. Molly and Bloom transform Hellenism in this moment. Like any good teacher or attentive parent or spouse, Bloom seizes his opening, stepping through the portal to present Molly a fresh and eternal life-changing recognition. Molly takes up and reads her text to experience being born again. It seems possible that Rudy is with us, born again too. Metempsychosis may occur in birth, a soul passing from mother to child, or in the rebirth of the dead. Metempsychosis describes the passing on of life to posterity by Amor Matris, teaching and awakening the dead, not only in individual citizens, but in the common life of a city like Dublin. May the lost be found. So many legions of dead suffering ancestors and Dubliners living a death in life through Amor Matris, felt within and received from others, we incorporate the dead into us and merge ourselves into them via the mother love that makes us begin to know metempsychosis. The devoted mirroring of Amor Matris lets you know who you are and nourishes the sense that you are not alone. With this sense incorporated, one can be confident and launch into the new undaunted. Mothering renews and awakens the dead. It gives birth to hope, connection, and the sense that you are known and accompanied and can reach beyond fear and stand up to tyrannies. There are so many stories that teach us the power and centrality of Amor Matris for spurring self-knowledge, rebirth, vigor, and freedom. In Greek mythology, birth is literally, fundamentally renewal like Persephone, returning in the spring. In Plato's reincarnation myth of Ur, rebirth leads to liberation from tyrants. And here in Ulysses, birth may be symbolic. Elijah may come again in the person of Bloom. What did Socrates learn from his mother? How to birth thoughts, said Stephen. Without birth, thoughts never live. Death rules you are in hell among the shadows. And then with birth, of course, there is Mary, to whom Leopold's thoughts and prayers repeatedly drift throughout Joyce's novel. Fascinated with Mary, Leopold speculates about her, blue-robed, white, come to me, God she is, or a goddess. It seems apt that Molly, Mary on, tells her husband that she is planning to sing Love's Old Sweet Song, a summary epithet for Amor Matris. Mothers care, caress, and sing sweet lullabies. Music by its nature expresses Amor Matris, the song that never ends. Over song or psalm, death shall have no dominion. Death and grief are in one sense insurmountable, but via song, as Molly shows us, they are greetable and there can be no reconciliation if there has been no sundering. We are all broken in the agony of birth and the pain of life and loss, but we mother new births into life, like a bear licking its newborn cubs to breath. The mother in us nur nurtures at the incarnate flesh to life and health. Through Ulysses, we hear the music that mothers us to a new Jerusalem, or at least a new Dublin. Ulysses proclaims Amor Matris as the only true thing, the word love known to all men. Ulysses ends with our hope that one day, on this day, both Stephen and Molly will overcome tyranny. And there seems to be grounds for this hope. Molly reflects in her final soliloquy that Boylan, the lover she has turned to over Bloom, 
has treated her like a tyrant and objectified her like an animal. She notes to herself that even though he is an older man, Poldy has more spunk in him. Yes. There's hope for Stephen, too, in the nascent mothering love he practices in caring for his students. He mothers them, calling to mind the Athena-like dairy woman, who, like Bloom, treated him with respect and nourished him with her milk. Teaching his students, Stephen reflects, Amor matris, subjective and objective genitive. With her weak blood and way sour milk, she had fed him and hid from sight of others his swaddling bands. I'll end with a story from Hamlet, which haunts Ulysses throughout. Tell us a story, sir, a ghost story. Okay. List, oh, list, says the famous murdered father ghost. Bloom and Stephen in relation as father and son, Odysseus and Telemachus, or Hamlet, sonless and fatherless, wander, dispossessed, distraught, exiled in their own homes, dressed all in black, mourning, looking for love in a rotten state. How does the dispossessed child find the mother within, the land of Aaron, the Tir Nanog, when betrayed by his natural mother and mother country, spiritually, politically, and economically? A woman has played Hamlet for 408 nights. Why not an Irishman, Stephen asks. Why not you, reader? Ulysses, as Stephen's revised version of Hamlet, can set you free. May our three, Molly, Bloom, and Stephen, rise up from tyrannical conspiracy, leave fear behind, and risk the nurturing, loving joy and sorrowful, suffering dialectic of Amor Matris. And may you too, listener, hear her song. <laughs>